Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Bible Ponder for this week. Um, we're continuing our series looking at major themes in the Bible and um, how they um, can help us interpret the rest of the Bible for us as we're just sort of reading through here and there. Um, kind of knowing these major themes will help us um, to kind of know where we're at. So that's why we've been looking at a few of these things. So the first um, kind of major themes we looked at, if you want to go back and watch these videos, um, I would encourage you to do that. Um, was looking at kind of the dual theme of exile and exodus and, and this idea throughout the Bible of um, the people of God um, being exiled for disobedience, but ultimately God delivering them and, and returning them to a right state in, in the promised land or in a sort of metaphorical promised land. Um, the theme we looked at last week is the idea of wilderness in these times of wilderness in our lives and the time of wilderness that kind of comes up again and again in the Bible and how it's used as, as a literary idea. But it's not um, a monolithic idea. It doesn't always mean one thing. And also it's often a sort of retrospective, um, the way we look back at the wilderness and interpret um, for our, ourselves where God was rather than looking at the wilderness in, in our own lives or other people's and trying to determine where God is in those moments. Um, so please do go back and, and have a watch of those. Um, at the end of the series, we'll do a Zoom discussion, kind of going back through all of them and, and talking a bit about how they all fit together and, and how they can help us um, continue to read the Bible for ourselves. So today's um, major theme is, is a really, really big one. Um, I mean, obviously, they're all major themes, but this one is, is especially big um, because it's the idea of covenant. And um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the actual specific covenants in the Bible that God makes with different people. Um, and also talk about the larger idea of covenant and what that means for us and how that affects us today. So to do a big run through of kind of the major covenants that God makes um, in the Bible, the first covenant is a covenant between God and humanity in the Garden of Eden, a covenant of, um, you know, you will not eat of, of the tree and you can be here with me in my presence. And, and that morphs into, again, a sort of change of that when um, Adam and Eve are found to have sinned. And then they are expelled from the garden. That covenant shifts and, and changes. But that's the very first covenant that's, that's made. So very early on in the, the story of creation, God is already um, drawing near to human beings and making covenants. Um, the next major covenant is a covenant with Noah, that God will not destroy the world again by flood. And that um, God has saved Noah and, and his family from that. Then after that, you have Abraham, and you kind of have almost several stages of covenants with Abraham. You have the covenant um, specifically of circumcision that then gets passed on through generations of Israelites and, and still continues to this day. And you have um, a covenant about descendants and, and all of these kind of tied together, and they're sort of layered as one big covenant with Abraham and that essentially these, this is the promised land. Your descendants will inhabit it. They will worship me, and it, it sort of establishes the, the people of Israel as God's people. And then um, the next major covenant that you get is a covenant again with the people of Israel, but this time after the Exodus, through Moses, you have the giving of the law, of the Torah. So rather than just a covenant with Abraham that's based on Abraham's faith that's counted to him as righteousness, which we'll talk about that word here in a minute, but you also get then the actual giving of the law, the specific laws that then the people of Israel are to follow to keep up their end of the covenant. And the covenant then is from God saying, I will be your God. You will be my people. I will look after you. I will care for you. I will protect you. All of those things. And you will obey my law. It's essentially that covenant. And then you have another covenant with um, King David when he comes along that his um, lineage and his um, kingdom would last forever. And that um, through that, eventually you get the idea of the Messiah coming from the line of David. That is through that covenant specifically with King David. And then lastly, you have um, the most important covenant for us, and that is the covenant with us through the Eucharist, through the Lord's Supper, that Jesus says, and we'll read this text in a bit, um, 
that this is the, you know, take this bread, this is my body, take this cup, this is my blood of a new covenant. So the covenants are often um, marked with sacrifice, marked with a blood spilling, especially um, the Mosaic covenant. And, and there in the kind of climax of the Mosaic covenant being that the day of atonement, when a lamb is sacrificed and the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies. And that that act is sort of mirrored in Jesus's death. And especially in the Gospel of John, John picks up on those themes and those motifs of the Day of Atonement and the Lamb without blemish and, and relating those to Jesus and his blood poured out as a sacrifice. And so that's where we get to our covenant. And so all of these different human covenants with God lead up to this final one. And the point ultimately is that God keeps God's side of the covenant, that in all of these covenants, God is not the one who fails. God is not the one who um, fails to hold up God's end of the bargain. It, it's always the human beings that, that fail um, to hold up their end, whether by disobeying the laws or worshiping idols or um, whatever, turning to, to violence in, in the beginning of the Noah covenant, um, God destroys the earth because human beings are said to have become far too violent. And in um, different points, you have kind of the reasons, and it's often idolatry. It's falling away from following the law. Um, in Ezekiel 34, you get a really um, strong um, reference to how Israel and especially the, the religious elite of Israel has failed their end of the covenant as they are to care for people. They are to be the shepherds of the people of Israel. And then that extends out into the world is the vision that Isaiah has that uh, Israel would be a sort of city on a hill and a light for the nations and the Gentiles. And in Ezekiel 34, God says, you were supposed to be the shepherds, but you have failed. So I will come and I will be the shepherd of my people. I will do that thing. I will come and shepherd my people. And then Jesus, of course, picks that up as God incarnate, saying, I am the good shepherd coming to, to do that. So Jesus then is fulfilling this covenant and enacting a whole new covenant with people that's not built on law. And this is where Paul really comes in and talks a lot about this, especially in the book of Romans. He talks a lot about how this new covenant that we have is not one about us following specific laws, doing specific sacrifices and, and doing these little actions down to the letter, but it's a covenant of grace and faith. So let's talk a bit about grace and faith and especially the word righteousness. So I think often in our modern English speaking world, the word righteousness comes to our minds. And I, I think it brings, at least for me, maybe for you as well, the, an idea of a kind of morality, that someone who is righteous is, is a good person morally, and maybe they're even polite and kind and all of these things, but they, you know, they don't do bad things. A righteous person is not one that you would find in prison, for instance. You're a righteous person is, is a good, upstanding citizen. But that's a very modern kind of English morphing of that word um, in, as how it's kind of changed a little bit over time just to mean someone who's a very moral person. And that morality is kind of subjectively defined by our culture around us. But the idea of righteousness in, in the Bible, and specifically in the New Testament, the idea of someone who is righteous or a people who are, who are righteous, is the idea of covenant faithfulness. Covenant faithfulness. That's what righteous means for, for Paul and for other writers in the New Testament. So the idea of someone being righteous or a people being righteous is that they are being faithful to the covenant that they have with God. And so Paul talks about how even though we have failed, God is still righteous. And because of Jesus, we are then able to become righteous, to have that covenant faithfulness almost instilled in us because of Jesus. So even though we have done nothing to earn it, we receive grace. And that grace gives us righteousness, not because we've earned it, not something that we achieve through good works. Again, not morality, not that we do good things and then we become righteous, but we are righteous because God has declared it so through Jesus's work and through Jesus's death and through that cup, that blood, which is a new covenant. And that is grace. 
And so faith or faithfulness is part of adhering to this covenant. But that covenant, that new covenant, is that we have received grace. So we don't achieve any right standing with God through our actions, but we are given grace and given a state of righteousness, of covenant faithfulness. And that's a really important distinction for us, and especially as we often tie ourselves in knots over the debate of, of is it grace or is it works or how, how do we get right with God and, and we'll you know, always default because we are Reformed or Protestants you know, in the Church of Scotland to, well, you know, it's nothing we do. We don't earn salvation. Um, but at the same time, you should be reading your Bible. You should be praying. You should be doing all of these things. Otherwise, God's going to be mad or God's going to be upset. And it's really hard for us as um, sort of self-effacing Reformed, you know, Scottish people to, to admit that um, it doesn't have to be that, oh, no, it's it's fine. You get grace, but actually you should be doing all of these things because you need to be a good person. And we can just let that go. And it's not about ever earning it. It's not about doing certain things. Otherwise, God will be mad. That's the old way. The new way is that we have a state of righteousness through Jesus. And so what I'll read is the institution of that new covenant. And I'm going to pick one specifically from Luke 22. But ultimately, this idea of a new covenant comes up a lot. It's one of the, the stories of Jesus that's um, written down for us in lots of places. So you have the story of the new covenant, the institution of the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26. You have it very similarly, almost word for word in Mark 14. Again, very similarly with a few things changed around in Luke 22. Um, John specifically does not give us the story of the institution of the Lord's Supper. But John often has a way of taking things that are in the first three Gospels and telling, giving us the same message with a different story. So um, John gives us the, um, you know, the, the story of turning water into wine as, as sort of a new thing that he gives us and the other Gospels don't give us. So John's often giving us a new flavor. What John does give us as an addition to the story of the feeding of the 5,000, is Jesus talking about how Moses gave the people manna from heaven and, and, and is able to, you know, through God, the manna comes and feeds the people. But Jesus says, I am the bread of life, and whoever eats of me will not be hungry again. And so for John, ultimately the story of the bread of life kind of mirrors the Eucharist story. And so it's, again, Moses did this, but I do this. So again, that covenant language. And then also um, a story of Jesus from the pen of Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, um, when uh, Paul recounts the Lord's Supper, the institution of the Lord's Supper, with very, very similar, almost identical language to Matthew and Mark. Um, we also have that there in 1 Corinthians 11. I'm going to read Luke's account because it's a little bit different. And um, so I think I, I like kind of that difference to bring out some flavor. So Luke 22 um, beginning in chapter or beginning in verse 14. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they begin to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this. So for Luke, he has, this is the new covenant in my blood. So we're going to covenant with blood. But what do we take away from this? Um, aside from the idea of righteousness and, and faith and faithfulness and all of these things being tied more um, in a biblical sense to the idea of a covenant faithfulness and that covenant side for us is fulfilled in Jesus so that that our side of the covenant has already been fulfilled. 
There's no need for us to try and fulfill it because we could never fulfill it. We could never be good enough to fulfill our side of the covenant as equal partners to God or in any sense like that. So Jesus has filled our end of the covenant. And so we are then righteous. But there's another side of it that I think is important for us. And that is that the whole idea of this biblical theme of covenant that comes up in these specific covenants, um, but it's also just a, a, the idea of it is is just throughout the entire Bible and it embeds so many stories. Specifically, there's one in, in Hosea. Hosea has a kind of extended metaphor where through the prophet Hosea, God demonstrates how God feels about the covenant by having Hosea interact with um, with a woman and, and to see her faithfulness and how that interacts then with how God sees the covenant playing out with Israel. And so not just in the specific covenants that we talked about, but all throughout the Bible, the idea of God's covenant with human beings is present, is just throughout every, it just bleeds onto every page. And so what that tells us is that God is not a dispassionate, faraway God who is unfeeling and uncaring about us, but God is close. God is interested in a relationship with human beings. God is interested in relating to us and specifically having covenants with us. That's something that is um, intimate and close and that's not just, um, well, I made you have fun or even a, I want to dictate everything you do as in you are puppets and, and God is pulling the strings, but God wants to have a covenant with us and, and be in that sort of relationship with us as human beings. And I think that's really important for us to take away that God cares that much about us to, to want to be in relationship to us as human beings. So that is a whirlwind tour of the really massive biblical theme of covenants. I hope that you learned some things. I hope it gets you to think. Um, there's a lot to talk about and unpack there that uh, maybe we'll get to at the end in our Zoom discussion. So keep an eye out for when that's going to come up in a few weeks. Um, I'd love to see you there. Um, but ultimately, thanks for, for watching and thanks for checking this out. And we'll see you next week for next week's video. Have a good evening.